This is BBC One Southwest. Now, Juliet back on 50 years of television from Britain's favourite regional broadcaster. In the spring of 1961, a small band of TV pioneers launched a news programme for the Southwest in a studio the size of a sitting room. Everything we did was handcrafted. We didn't, for one of the things, we never had teleprompt. So we either had to take it, read it from a script or make it up. 50 years on, what they began has become must-see TV. Local troops prepare to set sail to Libya as the government announces hundreds of redundancies in the Royal Navy. From national disasters... Oil from the ruptured tanks was borne by the Gulf Stream towards the holiday beaches of the southwest. To national treasures. This book, Kramer's War, is set in Germany during the... Ger ah! <laughs> Sorry. What is that in your hand? Have I got it right? It's a randy pole? We celebrate half a century of the most popular regional television service in Britain. Ram Telecine, five, four, three, two, one. It's 6 p.m. in the Spotlight studio. Justin Lee and Victoria Graham are about to go live to viewers in Devon, Cornwall, and the wider Southwest. Watched by an old hand. Well, I must say it looks very, very smooth. It's very sophisticated <laughs> these days, Justin. Hello, Jim. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. How are you? <laughs> You're carrying the burden, though, are you? Well, we're trying. Yeah. Joe Pengelly was one of the Southwest's first TV newsreaders. Unemployment. The number of out of work in the Southwest rose in the last month by 1,500. There was no spacious studio back then. Instead, Joe and a handful of colleagues worked from what is now BBC Plymouth's conference room. Well, this certainly brings back memories. It, it seems so small. This is hardly bigger than my lounge at home. I mean, just think how we were packed in here. Dear old Peter Crampton sitting over there presenting the programme. We've had two huge cameras, two cameramen and a studio manager. How we didn't trip over, I can't imagine. Over now to the Southwest at Six news desk and Joe Pengelly. We never had teleprompt, so we either had to take a, read it from a script or make it up, which we did some of the time. Um, this had, had, its, it had its hazards because I remember on, on, on one occasion I just couldn't remember who Plymouth Argyle were playing. And so I had to say, and Plymouth Argyle are playing their opponents. Until the 60s, BBC television in the South West was run from Bristol. But on April the 20th, 1961, the first 10 minutes news programme was broadcast from Ingledean in Plymouth, which is where the BBC remains to this day. Joe and his fellow pioneers owed their start in television in part to the success of ITV. In 1961, Westwood, the ITV service, had won the franchise to broadcast for the first time to the South West, and the BBC decided to be a bit proactive, get in there first, create a new service, because all the evidence is, is that if you're first with a new television service, you build an audience, and if you produce a good service, you'll hang on to it. BBC television in the South West. <laughs> Within 18 months, the news service had grown into a 25-minute show. The elegant presenter was calmness personified. Hello, everyone. We have several interesting people for you to meet tonight. Ross Salmon will be telling us what's going on down on the farm. But a degree of panic often lurked behind that poise. Anything could go wrong. Film could break or anything could happen. Uh, there was no backup at all. A beatnik problem for the Isles of Scilly. Lately, in the last few months, more and more of them have been making the island their base. Now the islanders are worried by the effect they may have on the tourist trade. The Council of the we, we muddled through, and I mean, it didn't happen that often, really, but there's always the fear that it might, you know, so it did frighten us a bit. And at the end of the day, of course, you know, when, it, when we went out and there were no problems, oh, the relief was marvellous, you know. 
For the first time, the BBC's Southwest viewers were brought stories from their own region every evening, often illustrated with dramatic pictures. Just two cameramen served the entire patch, with equipment from a bygone era. Um, I used to have a, a camera which was um, clockwork, and you used to have to wind it up, shoot, and it would last for 16 seconds, the shot, and uh, then you have to wind up again and do more shots. And another cameraman called Cliff Summers, who's now dead, had the sound camera, and that was an electric camera. And he, uh, Cliff would do one week on mute and one week on sound, and I would also do one week on, on it. And the two of us covered the whole southwest of England. OK, Colin, how's that? You happy with that? Colin's film had to be taken back to Plymouth for processing before it could be edited and transmitted. But the output reeled in the viewers. By 1962, Plymouth's nightly news programme had become by far the most successful in the country. The audience reaction, too, or the viewers' reaction, I mean, it was amazing the number of uh, phone calls we used to get. They, were, they thought we were part of the family, really. Uh, and I suppose it was the fact that it was the early days, and they saw people um, they knew on, on, the, on the telly, you know, you know on the telly. Uh, Mr. Jones has been on, and this sort of thing. And I think uh, this is what, what made us very much part of the community, really. Until tomorrow at the same time, then. Good night. It's been a hard day's night. And I've been working... In 1963, South West at Six got a new slot and a new name. These were heady times. When the Beatles came to Plymouth in 1964, reporter David Lomax struggled to keep up with the swinging 60s. Did you vote? No. Did you? Yeah, well, no, because... Well, I, there you I go, then. There's two of us, so don't start picking on me if you didn't vote either. No, well... Yeah. See that, Johnny? Hey, comes up here. Did, did, did the other people vote? vote? I don't think so. Did you vote? No. What Never would you vote if you, if you... Oh, you didn't have time? I'm very busy, no, no. Touring. Scottish nationalist, I'd vote. Not Tory? No, I said we're touring. As a young reporter, Sue Lawley caught the mood of the time with a memorable piece about the dangers of overexposure. Excuse me, sir, it was your back you were looking at. It's looking a bit red and raw. Yeah. Does it feel very sore? Well, what would you like me to say? I'd like you to tell me whether your back feels sore. Well, at the moment, it's killing me. And a young whippersnapper joined BBC Plymouth at the tender age of 21. Well, now, the bat's lifelong enemy is the owl. The two just, for some reason, don't get on together. They said, oh, we've got a reporter coming down called Hugh Scully. Um, so I said, oh, great, Hugh Scully, who's Hugh Scully? So along he comes, along comes this little boy. <laughs> so, he seems so young, I don't know if he's that much younger than me, but he did have this very young countenance. And this little boy did this brilliant piece to camera, absolutely brilliant. I thought, wow, we've got a star here. Well, just one more thing, the owls are stuffed. And so began Hugh Scully's 15 years with Spotlight. He and Colin Rowe covered one of the region's biggest ever stories. It began with an early morning phone call from a contact in the Isles of Scilly. He said, Hugh, have you got a copy of uh, Lloyd's Register of Shipping in the office? And I said, yes, of course. He said, will you look up a ship for me? I said, sure. What's her name? Tory Canyon, he said. She's just gone aground on the Seven Stones Reef and she's spewing out oil. I used to do aerial pictures for days running. We did different pictures, different things happened. And then it was decided they were going to bomb it. And in came the first bombers over the RAF, and I filmed them coming through, and they missed. The bombs fell all over the Victorian Canada, they didn't hit. And we waited, and we were told on the radio, stay where you are, don't go any lower. There's the Navy are coming in, and Navy aeroplanes came in, and they hit it. Wow. Colin's pictures were seen across the world. The cleanup lasted for weeks. It was a pretty hefty operation for Spotlight, too, because the disaster happened at the very tip of the region. I was driving from Plymouth 
down to Penzance to Coverack to Mausel to St Michael's Mount. We were doing it in relays and of course we were working with film, not video. We didn't have, we didn't have the advantage of, of satellite so we had to literally hand carry the films backwards and forwards, edit them when we got back to BBC Plymouth. It was quite an operation. The Torrey Canyon disaster showed that BBC Plymouth could cope with breaking news. But the station was also starting to make documentaries reflecting big changes to everyday life in the region. Petroxto is shrinking. There were 600 people a century ago. By the 1960s, only half that number. 300, 290, 280. And now, young Angela's going. Only the young migrate. Colour TV started in 1967, but it was 1974 before it reached the southwest. By then, Spotlight had begun its 14-year link-up with Nationwide, which featured the best stories from the regions and presented new technical challenges. Good evening. In Spotlight tonight, child cruelty. They had to prove that they could cut instantly from Plymouth to Bristol to Manchester to Birmingham and so on. So I might begin, to be or not to be, cut to Bristol, that is the question. Cut to Manchester, whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer. We went around and round the regions with this soliloquy from Hamlet, proving that the engineers could, uh, could cut in time. Well, first tonight, the Plymouth Fire, and police in the city have begun... A... Hugh spent ten years presenting Spotlight before moving to London to host Nationwide itself. But while still in Plymouth, he managed to find time for the odd break from desk duties. Colin Rowe and I would often spend time, usually in the bar, um, plotting our escape, you know, like going to the Channel Islands for a week. And we'd come up and present the news editor with five good stories based in the Channel Islands, simply because we love going there. Right, this is Channel Island story, row three, slate two. Can I have the book, Joe? Yeah. Thanks very much. Okay. Okay, then you're off to go. This book, Kramer's War, is set in Germany during the. Ger yeah. Ah! It's okay. I'll, 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 <laughs> sorry, sorry. For Hugh, leaving the region he loved was a wrench. But another young journalist couldn't wait to move on. I mean, it was fun to do on the day, but I found the attitudes in regional television absolutely, um, they were dinosaur-like. What is that in your hand? Uh, have I got it right? It's, it's a Randy Pole? Yes, it's a, this is a reproduction of the original Randy Pole. Various colours you see, about two foot long, and very useful. What for? Well, for touching a lady up, you know. The thing I did find out about regional television was it is immensely old-fashioned. It, it had a view that, you know, girlies did these sort of stories, which I found, uh, frankly, um, a little disturbing. But at least being ambushed in Dorset gave Kate a bit of training for life as a war correspondent. Now, finally, the weather. The day will be mostly cloudy, with light rain or drizzle at times, and fog on high ground. Winds will be At this time, the BBC certainly reflected traditional values, ending each day by paying its respects to the monarch. But a revolution was on the way. You had a region which stretched from Penzance all the way up, up to Kent, so they decided to create, if you like, extra sub-regions with much more programming um, to build up centres like Plymouth, which had up until then really been just doing a news service, and give them extra programmes to do. Something like, you know, a, a half-hour programme a week. BBC Southwest became a separate region in 1970. A new studio was built, and the next 20 years saw Plymouth lead the field in regional broadcasting. One famous innovation was the recruitment of the BBC's first regional weather presenter. And when I did the first one, the paint was still wet on the board that they'd rigged up. And it was awful. I tell you what, it was awful. How I survived the first six months, I'll never know. Craig Rich served a quarter of a century in a job with huge responsibility. Still very windy, it'll go around to the south, perhaps touching gale force on these headlands, maybe even Travaux's up there getting a, a gale force, maybe even force seven on Pearl Point there. But we'll get the I always beefed up what the wind speed was. I prefer 
somebody not to go to sea because I said it's going to be a say four six and then complain than to get somebody's parents say to me complain because their son or daughter or relation has been lost at sea because they thought it was going to be force four and in fact it was force six. The forces of nature have created many of the region's most dramatic stories. In 1979 BBC Southwest reported the unfolding tragedy of the Fastnet race, as a result of which 15 sailors lost their lives. The region's coverage received a BAFTA nomination. We were all sailors, actually, at the BBC in those days, so it hit us particularly hard, and it was a terrible story. Uh, like all the big stories then, were really sort of sea-based. I mean, there was a, uh, after the Fastnet, there was a Pemney lifeboat disaster, which was, uh, you know, just hit the whole of the South West, not just the, the local community. As wreckage of the Penley boat, the Solomon Brown, comes ashore, six bodies are recovered. Hope is abandoned for the others. Experts agree that the lifeboat, recently tested for its self-writing ability, must have struck the coaster in that gallant attempt to take off the remaining four people. The saviour it shocked us so much, it was almost unreal. You know, when a tragedy happens like that, you can't absolutely absorb the horror of it. I think that was the, the first big tragic story I'd ever covered and I certainly would go home thinking about that one. A year later Fern Britton found herself covering another major story from a somewhat unusual perspective. When the Falklands War was declared the registrar's offices suddenly started opening at 8 o'clock in the morning because the men were going out on the ships they'd take six weeks to get there we all thought it'd be over before they got there but those who were romantically inclined and attached decided to get married before they sailed. And we went straight from the registrar's office up to the parade ground um, where the commanding officer stood on his dais, gave a very stirring speech, finishing with, some of you here may not be coming back and I salute you all and now quick march to the South Atlantic. BBC Southwest pioneered the two-presenter format. Fern was one of several future stars to join Chris Denham during the 1980s. The South West Water Authority this afternoon confirmed that because of the government's cutbacks on spending announced in the autumn budget, customers... In the Sue King also worked alongside Chris, as did the late Jill Dando. Good evening. Urgent talks have been taking place... Who also presented with Chris Slade. The new Spotlight studio was used for a host of other programmes. Miles Kington presented a game show. Right, so let's go to the first name, which is Frithelstock. There were programmes for young people. Tonight on Matrix, how they've survived the low season in rainwashed new key, Pete the Punk Poet expounds. Here in the studio, there's music by the works from Calstock. And how to create a hairstyle that'll uh, drive your mother round a twist. And Craig got his own series. In one of the programmes, one of the, the series that did That's Rich, Fern performed. Why didn't I just say no? But I was very young, you know, and in the blinking lycra all-in-one catsuit. For the audience, they thought it was fantastic because everything was moving. <laughs> Some evil person dug it out after 30 years and stuck it on YouTube. And from now on, I see it everywhere. One of BBC Southwest's most notable gifts to the nation came after its features editor got a ticking off at Plymouth's fish market. This chap called Fred Brimacombe, I know his name now, he said, it's all very well you tourists coming around here, he said, but, you know, you don't eat the fish, you don't eat the local fish. All you eat is cod, place and mackerel. All this stuff here, all these gurnards, all this cuttlefish, all these red mullet, they go off to France and Spain. And you buggers don't eat these. And I, I thought, well, I know a man who does. Keith Floyd.
You don't have to move the cameras to look for me. They know I've got to move to get the food in. Don't be so wet. You know, it's the pot that counts. I actually found it a little bit insulting, but at the same time, I was very grateful for it because at least we knew where the camera should be. I said stay with the pot. You see, watch up. Now come to me. Hold on a minute. Come back, come back. Look, this is very difficult for me. I am a cook. I present television cookery programmes, but I'm not a director. I do rely on competent staff. Would you get it right in future, please? Thank you. Right. Pot. Back to the pot. Mark my words, he said. One day, cooks on TV will be... Uh, as famous as lead singers of rock and roll bands and racing car drivers. He said, mark my words. Within a few months, Floyd on Fish was repeated on national television. It revolutionised the way cookery programmes were made. Not far from England's end, where Cornwall pushes out into the Atlantic, the following year, David Pritchard made a poignant film about the decline of tin mining. There lives a very old tin mine called Gevel. Or at least, it did live. Feelings ran high when Margaret Thatcher's government refused the mine's plea for financial support. They always say there's a Cornishman at the bottom of every tin mine or any mine, right? When the last Cornishman came out of Giver, and if that is the last, she ought to be drawn and quartered and dropped them that shaft. That's my opinion of her, pal. This was one of the last films made by the features department before it took on a new direction. David Pritchard continued to make films with Floyd and later with Rick Stein, but he did it from outside the BBC with one of the region's most successful independent companies. I actually just wanted to make some really good programmes that would get shown on the network. I didn't really want to make programmes just for the region. But I had a sense that the wind was changing, and I didn't want to do sort of current affairs, local current affairs and news. January the 13th was an unlucky day for Cornwall. On that day, 10 million gallons of grossly polluted water spewed out of the old Nan Giles mine near Truro. As part of a move to toughen up journalism in the regions, the features department now focused on current affairs. We were offering a raft of programming which duplicated quite a bit of what network was doing, quiz shows, entertainment, I mean, youth programmes. And the decision was made to, to focus more on what could we do for the region which would really work for the region. So let's look at, you know, the key issues, the key themes, the key stories, the things that affect everyone's lives and examine them in a bit more detail. Um, obviously, we lost the broad range of programming, but we gained a kind of focus. And all the evidence is that that focus on, on current affairs, on contemporary issues, proved very popular with the public. Bartonwood Vera III was in her prime when she had to be slaughtered in January this year. She was three years old. It was little consolation to her, but Bartonwood Vera III was about to become a major clue in a veterinary detective story. At stake is the future of Britain's pedigree cow population and an export business worth £30 million a year. In the last few days, Western Approach produced the first investigation into BSE, so-called mad cow disease. Thirteen years later, Close Up won a Royal Television Society award for a haunting film made with Annie McVeigh, whose daughter Claire was a victim of CJD, the human form of mad cow disease. And we came back, and a week later, the people of Ilfracombe had raised more money to send Claire on her dream, which was to drive in a limousine. But not just that, to go to London and have all these beautiful photographs taken, glamour photographs. And, uh, and there's a part of me that wanted to be really excited for her, and we were. You know, it was, she was so thrilled with this limousine and the pampering, it was wonderful. But I knew these were probably the last photographs I would have with her. Hello and welcome back to a new series of Inside Out with stories from where you live. The present occupant of the current affairs slot is a mix of softer features and hard-hitting reports, such as the story of the police investigation into Vanessa George. This new focus on current affairs was part of bigger changes at BBC Southwest. A major new investment in the future of the BBC here in the Southwest. 
From this mayhem should evolve a new building housing a new Spotlight studio and new equipment to help us in our efforts to cover the region. Back in 1991, yours truly announced we'd had to find temporary accommodation while our studio was refurbished. Until the dust clears, however, we hope you approve of our temporary accommodation and our temporary wallpaper and bear with us while we find our feet. By the time I left later that year, Spotlight had more or less evolved into its current format, albeit with Russell Labby and Teresa Driscoll in charge. In 1996, they introduced a new young voice from Cornwall. Not recent, Mary found itself under several feet of water after severe storms last week. The clearing up started almost immediately, but many traders didn't know who to turn to for help. That was my first taste of television reporting, was this terrible mess that had been made in Ottery St Mary, the upset that had been caused there, and the awful smell that day. And I came home and I could smell on my clothes the smell of the rotting food from Ottery St Mary. So that was my start on Spotlight. Justin is now one half of Spotlight's current partnership. Two major stories have happened on his watch. The first was the foot and mouth epidemic. For a time, it felt like it was never going to end. Um, and I remember we were keeping a tally of the number of cases, and it was going up and up and up and up. And then I remember there was a certain relief because we'd reached a plateau, that the numbers weren't growing anymore. Uh, and then we thought, perhaps we've turned a corner here, and then we got into summer properly, and, and things started very slowly to get back to normal. The other story that always stands out in my mind is the flooding of Boss Castle. A major air and water rescue operation is now underway in Boss Castle. There are reports that up to 50 people are trapped in their cars after flash flooding. A group of eight people are trapped on the top of the Boss Castle Visitor Centre after a wall of water swept through the streets. The next day, in fact the next few days, almost for a whole week, I then went to Boss Castle every day. Well, for those simply doing their jobs, many can only describe them as heroes and heroines. They helped bring an end to a nightmare for those caught up in the torrent of water raging through this village. The Boss Castle story demonstrated Spotlight's ability to react quickly to unfolding events, thanks to technology that the Plymouth pioneers could only dream of. BBC television from the South West started out with a 10-minute news service made by a small team struggling to cope with a new medium. Today, the station employs nearly 80 staff plus freelancers, and they produce more than 360 hours of original programming each year. Right, it's time for the weather forecast. Obviously, David's still with us. So, uh... Its output remains as popular as ever, not least with those who cut their teeth in the South West. I was allowed to make some big mistakes there and learn my trade and I thank everybody who I work with who taught me so much. I'm still useless but I learned a lot and I loved it and maybe one day I could come back and do the weather or something. <laughs> I suppose if you were to have a meter on the back of my television you would see that I watch Spotlight more frequently than any other programme. So I think it's the still the best of regional broadcasting and I hope that the BBC never camps with it. Like the region it reflects, BBC Southwest has changed with the times, but its purpose remains the same, to reflect the lives and concerns of the people who live in and love this very special corner of Britain.